Hello, I'm Rob Forsyth. Welcome to Liberalism in Question. In this half hour podcast series from the Centre for Independent Studies, we explore questions and challenges to liberalism today. My guest is Lorraine Findlay, the Human Rights Commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission. Welcome. Hello, how are you? What is a Human Rights Commissioner? Just, 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 <laughs> just a small question to start just, off Just with. so we, we know who, who, who I'm talking with. Well, the Australian Human Rights Commission is Australia's national human rights institution. We have a president, President Rosalind Croucher, and seven specific purpose commissioners, of which I'm one as the Human Rights Commissioner. And our broad remit as the Human Rights Commission is to protect and promote human rights around Australia. We're independent of government, which means we can advise government on actions they may take. We can recommend to government about things they can do to better protect rights or things they shouldn't be doing if they want to better protect rights. Um, and within my role um, as a Human Rights Commissioner, my focus is on promoting and protecting fundamental rights. So things like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, movement association, et cetera, et cetera. But also I take the lead in our work on things like immigration and asylum seekers, modern slavery, um, business and human rights, technology and human rights, and a whole variety of other matters. I was going to ask, are you busy? A little bit. <laughs> there is certainly a lot to do. And one of the um, really challenging things about this job is you never get to the end of the day and think that you've done absolutely everything you could possibly do. Because we know when it comes to human rights and freedoms, you always need to be looking at what more you can do to protect them, to promote them, to encourage people to respect them. Well, that leads to my to our copy today, which of course is liberalism in mm -hmm. question. Um, how important are, is human rights for a liberal society? Absolutely fundamental. I mean, the basis of a liberal society is the idea of freedom, and freedom and human rights are absolutely interlinked. You can't you can't have one without the other. Do we have human rights because there's a Human Rights Act, or because of the government? Is is that what? No, absolutely not. Um, certainly. In the modern world, human rights are generally expressed through laws and regulations, and that's how people tend to have an understanding of them. But it's really important to understand that they don't come from government. They don't start with government, because I actually think that's quite a dangerous idea. If you think of human rights as being the gift of government, well, then they could be taken away by government. And if we're to say that it's only through government that we experience human rights, well, that would mean that if government chose, we could have no human rights, and that's simply an untenable um, conclusion to reach. Where do they come from, then? That's a really hard question. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yes. It is. You know, in my view, the mere fact that you're a human being has some value and means that your life has meaning. And our human rights stem from the fact that we recognise there is something special about humanity. There's something special about being a human being that's deserving of respect and value mm. and dignity. Exactly what those rights are and how you express them, that's the really difficult thing. How do you define that general idea? So I can certainly say, I don't believe they come from government, although they're often expressed through government, but exactly how you limit them and define them and express them um, in terms of that natural rights theory is a lot more difficult. I understand that, but we, you're saying as I understand it, that human rights, freedoms, mm -hmm. you think particularly human rights in terms of freedoms from. Yes. That's rather, than, uh, come back to that in just a moment. They exist outside of government, mm -hmm. which means they exist outside of human society. I think they have to, yes. effectively. They are natural. Yes. And that brings us almost, and I don't go too far into this, but into, is it were a metaphysical or theological world, <laughs> right? You, you, you make, you, some claim is being made here, I, and I want to use it in the most broadest possible terms, mm -hmm. of a religious nature. I, I think you're right. And and it's one of those really things I find so interesting to think about because when you think of, and we've been talking um, before this interview about the um, Bentham idea of human rights being nonsense on stilts, and intellectually I can understand the reasoning behind that statement, but emotionally and spiritually it's not yeah. very satisfying. J Jerry Bentham, the um, 18th century, if I remember correctly, utilitarian thinker, he, uh, he poo-hooed the idea of rights other than through the government. He called them, what's it, nonsense, nonsense on stilts. stilts. But you're saying that can't be right. Well, I think intellectually I understand the argument, but it isn't very emotionally or spiritually satisfying. So if, and I'm not going to spend much more on this now, but if, if the world was literally meaningless, just a bunch of stuff whirring around, 
there would not be human rights in your view. It would just be, they'd be arbitrary for, rather than being somehow rooted in reality. I think human rights are what give us our humanity right, and what give us um, meaning in our lives in the sense of it takes us outside of ourselves because when you think about human rights, it's actually not an individualistic or selfish concept because understanding that I have human rights means I accept you have human rights. And so it naturally creates a way of thinking and being that involves you thinking about more than just yourself. And in my mind, you know, human rights is often derided these days as being a very individualistic, selfish type of concept. I actually think it's quite selfless because it forces you to think about how your actions impact on others and how as a community, we can actually all live together in a way that allows for the maximum amount of individual freedom um, within the society that we have. That's very interesting. You, you, you think that, and I must say, I fall into this trap myself. When I hear human rights talk, I often react somewhat negatively because it mm. seems to be a claim for something for somebody over against me rather than something I should be granting to them and all others. Mm. Have you always been a person who believed in human rights? Have you always been, you know, maybe it's a bit too late now you've got the job, but... Uh, <laughs> it would be have, worrying if I said no to that question. Well, no, pe people can change. No, people can change. People can, have, can, can, through life experiences, realise different things. Mm. Um, human rights are crucial for liberal society. Have you always been, as it were, a believer in liberalism in, in the broad sense? I've always been incredibly interested in people and interested in thinking about how the world around me could be improved and how people can have the opportunities to live the lives they want to lead and have the best available opportunities um, to be the people that they want to be. So I think I grew up in a household where we were always encouraged to be aware of the world around us. We were always encouraged to engage with people. And I was really brought up with that idea of service. Right. So the idea that you shouldn't just sit back and criticise things, you should actively get involved and really try to contribute to your community and your society because the world is about more than just you. Liberalism is often described, correctly in some senses, mm -hmm. as a philosophy based upon the individual, mm -hmm. even individualism. Is that not in somehow in tension with what you just said? You know, I think there's a balance to be struck because while it's focused on the individual, the fact is if you believe that you as an individual should be allowed to make your own choices and live your life in the way that best fulfills you, it naturally follows that you believe other individuals should also be able to do that. And the minute you start thinking about it in that aspect or extending it to that step, it becomes a philosophy that actually isn't selfish and individualistic. It's actually very selfless and involves you to think about not only your individual rights, but how to best allow other people to pursue theirs. So liberalism, in a sense, is altruistic as well as individualistic. I think so. One of the marks of liberalism as a, as a social organisation and, mm -hmm. and it reflects its history is that it, it bra brackets the really big questions in life mm -hmm. in order to get on with pluralism. Mm -hmm. it, it arose actually out of some of the crises of European conflicts, ideological and religious conflicts, I think, or a tiredness about the conflicts. Mm -hmm. And it still works today as a way of getting on with difference and pluralism. Mm -hmm. But if, you're, if, you're, if what you say is correct, there have got to be some areas of agreement as well. They do. It can't be just pluralism. Mm -hmm. So liberalism does have, does have to have some commitments, not just saying you all do your own things and it'll all turn out okay on the day. Sure. And is it the starting point for that, that recognition that being a human being is something that carries worth and therefore we should have respect for each other in that sense? So really, to my mind, the foundation, and you mentioned you know, wanting to get... Um, too um, philosophical, I suppose, or well, spiritual in the way we're thinking about this, but it really does boil down to that um, common creed of do unto others. Because at the end of the day, the foundation of human rights is really thinking about all of us as individual human beings, therefore being equal in dignity and deserving of equal respect. Since the do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? Common, you say. Uh, I would hope so. Perhaps not always in the modern no, no, world. No, no, this, this, this is an interesting point. That, that, of course, is a quote from Jesus. It is. And um, it is common, it's common today. That reflects, it seems to me, a fun, a, a, an issue here that liberal societies, or liberalism is not simply the natural way of the world, it's contingent, historically contingent upon a certain history, mm -hmm. at least so it is argued, even individualism. Do you think that's true? Or do you think it's somehow the natural state of human beings that, that if you take a look at the problems, you'll all, we'll all be nat naturally liberals, or does it not reflect the history of Western civilization, affected by Greek and Roman law at some levels, but particularly Christian and Judeo and, Ju and Jewish 
influences. Okay. Whether today you think that's rubbish or not today, the values have come from that particular historical story. Well, I think when you look through history and even when you look at the modern day, sadly, it's quite clear that it isn't an actual state of being because I think that it requires inevitably an aspect of self-control and self-restraint. And right. so when we talk about maximising freedom, it is an interesting tension because you talk on the one hand about wanting to maximise your individual freedom and yet to do that, you actually need to recognise it as an individual, there are restraints on you and there are responsibilities that attach to that. Yes. So the whole yes. idea of liberalism does have these inherent inconsistencies and conflicts because you do have to balance out the fact that my individual freedoms might conflict with your Yours. individual freedoms yeah. and how do we reconcile that? And I have a certain view of human beings, which is taken for granted today, mm -hmm. um, equal, equal quality of dignity, which going back, if you went back to the ancient world, they'd laugh at you. Yeah. <laughs> Aristotle wouldn't believe that for a moment. <laughs> or others said that. That's, that's, that's what I meant by, by the contingency of it. Mm -hmm. This raises a question. Liberalism has come out of a particular historical context. It's now leaving behind, in many real senses, the religious and philosophical world from which it came. Mm -hmm. Do you think it can survive now on its own steam or, do, or is that cutting off the root of a tree? Is, is it, is it ring bark the tree of, of values or does it now survive in its own, got so much momentum now that it doesn't matter if we cut off the philosophical religious back, um, underpinnings? You know, I, I think there's a lot in that question and a lot to unpack. I think whenever you remove foundations, yeah. there are unintended consequences. And there are things, I think, in our world that are foundational that we are risking throwing away in mm. the modern world without really thinking about what they mean and how they underpin our day-to-day -day lives. And, you know, to give just two examples, um, I think a, a belief in the importance of nation and country mm. is one, and I think a belief in the importance of family in another is another. However you define those, those are foundational structures in terms of the way our world operates. And when we remove them or try to underplay their significance, it always has unintended consequences. But the second point that I think follows on is, you, know, you mentioned, is it the natural state of things? I actually think at the moment there are far too many of us who, due to our experiences, where we've been living in a time in the arc of human history where there's been unprecedented stability and prosperity and peace mm. and too many of us I think assume that's the natural state of things and we've almost been lulled into this sense of thinking that liberalism and human rights are the natural order of things and that they'll simply keep progressing and moving forward without us really needing to do very much at all and that's a really dangerous way of thinking because you know, I've said a number of times that's something I believe is really important human rights are absolutely fundamentally important but they're not inevitable and I think when we lose sight of that, um, we run a very real risk of actually um, forgetting what we need to do to ensure that we continue to have them. You could say the world we're entering into today is changing from that freedom. Um, very Just much. for a moment. I mean, in the last literal year with the invasion of Ukraine, Ukraine. it's been a tremendous wake-up, shocking wake-up call to Europe for others who just taken for granted that the, quote, arc of history, unquote, was all going the right way. And now we suddenly have to fight for things we hitherto had taken for granted. Mm. And I think that's um, obviously a really um, current, straightforward, absolutely clear example. But more broadly, the democratic backsliding in the world that's yes. been occurring yes. is really concerning because, you know, and I, I've given this example in a number of speeches. There was a um, Lowy Institute um, survey in 2020 that looked at attitudes towards government um, in Australia and for people and... I don't want to quote this exactly because I'll risk getting it wrong, but um, in the age groups 18 to 29, it was something like 13% of people or respondents who said, you know, it really doesn't matter what type of government we have. And there are further core, and I think it was about 29%, but again, I don't have that figure in front of me, but who said that um, in some occasions, a non-democratic government can be just as good as a democratic government. When you start to think about human rights and freedom and liberalism, having you know, somewhere between 10 and 30% of young people who actually think the type of government you have doesn't really matter and democracy isn't that important, that's enormously concerning. Why do you think that is? Why, why do you think they think that? I think part of it is the fact that we have been living in this period that has been unprecedented in terms of general progression and stability yes. and security. 
And so people have almost forgotten how much these things need to be nurtured. They're, they don't know what it's like to live without these freedoms and therefore don't think they matter. Exactly right. And I think, you know, and, and secondly, they're frustrated. Government, government's frustrated. There's a real, just in many places, a frustration with the government mucking around. And maybe another way would be to have less politics and therefore a strong ruler. Well, and you know, one of the other things I think is that democracy by its very nature is messy and it's complex and it's frustrating because you don't always get your own way. So being um, understanding of the importance of that compromise that it's the, is at the heart of every democracy, that's something that you have to really focus on because it's so easy to just go, oh, it's too hard, I'm not getting my own way, mm -hmm. society's not exactly as I want it, and you lose sight of how important that heart of compromise really is. Are you hopeful that in the context of authoritarian regimes, um, particularly I'm thinking of the People's Republic of China, but there are other, mm. other there's a group of them around, what's happened to Turkey in the last few years, and, and some place in Europe people are worried about, the very issue you've, you've mentioned about the war, will mean that we'll rediscover again the value of liberalism. I hope so, but I think it, it's not something that you accidentally rediscover. I think it's something you need to actively okay. try to restore. And, you know, I, I also think it's really important you know, as a general life philosophy um, to hope for the best but to plan for the worst. And I think when it comes to thinking about human rights, it's really important in Australia that we're having conversations about how we can better protect and promote human rights and what human rights mean to us um, because unless we do that, they're not inevitable. Do you think the human rights language has been corrupt, not corrupted, ho hobbled somewhat by the culture wars that are going around? Mm. Um, I, I just wonder whether in the name of human rights, many things are claimed which seem to shut down freedoms and spe mm. freedom that you're talking about. Do you think there's a danger in that? I do. If I could give a very trivial example, ever since I started in the role as a human rights commissioner, the standard response from my children, I've got a 10-year-old and a 7-year-old, any time I ask them to do anything now is, but mum, that's against my human rights. And it's a really small example, but it's very easy for them to claim anything that they want <laughs> Is a human what, right. What do you say there? You should say, well, go and tell that to the commissioner. I, you know my line. That's what I say. <laughs> um, but, but it just um, demonstrates in a really trivial way, and I don't want to make light of the matter because it is a serious matter. We do tend to equate rights with wants, and they're quite different things. And there is a real risk. If you use human rights as a slogan to stop debate, that's a real problem because it's not the case that everything we want is an inalienable human right. And so I think there is concern over expanding the field of rights to such a point that it actually becomes a meaningless concept. And yet, as you said earlier, and I think quite rightly, there's not a, there's not agreement, mm -hmm. nor is there a agreed process to determine what counts as a human right. That's There's no there's no natural way to look it up. That's what it is. There mm. is this has to be a question of judgment, a question of Intuition, perhaps at times, even it's not a straightforward right. matter, and not even that. But on even on the rights where we agree at its core, it is a right. Exactly what that right means, and how far it stretches, and how it accommodates other rights. That's um, something where there can be disagreement as well. And the really interesting thing about that, which leads back to your comment about the culture wars, is that you know reasonable people can disagree about these things. And so I think when we talk about human rights, you these are issues that are so important and that mean so much to people, rightly so but there needs to be a civility and good faith brought to the discussion because reasonable people can disagree. It seems to me that, um, I'd like to know if you agree with this, that, that in a lot of the debates in the so-called culture wars, certainly on, on the left side, if I could put it way, the only human right being appealed to is the right not to be harmed. Um, you make a comment, no, that, you mustn't say that comment because it'll mean people will be harmed, their dignity will be harmed, they may have their life be harmed. That seems to be reducing civil rights down to the one the one basic right of not to be harmed. Do, 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 do you rec recognise that going on? Well, and I think the danger as well is when we talk about human rights, we often tend to um, talk about them in siloed ways, um, failing oh, yes. to recognise the fact that rights are actually very interconnected and it's not possible to talk about rights in a really disconnected way because it's actually when they collide with each other that they become important 
in terms of having the discussion about how we accommodate different yeah, rights. But let's go there. I, was going, I want to raise that question. You do, you do believe that because there's at least two at least two human rights, there's going to be, <laughs> if there's at least two, there'll be a conflict between them at some certain in in the living in lived experience. Absolutely. Okay. And and sometimes and there you are know, we, we've spoken about compromise and the importance of balance. Yeah. Sometimes they're irreconcilable. And that's a reality. Sometimes, you know, there are rights that just directly conflict with each other and it's can, really can you hard. Think, can you give an example? Um, well, I, th- I think a, a really clear example, and it's getting into um, very complicated territory um, or controversial territory, but you look at the recent abortion debates, you have direct rights conflicting in terms of the rights of an unborn child versus the rights yes. um, of the of the mother. Although either side seems to discount, the, they don't acknowledge the conflict, they rem- they erase the other right. Correct. And one of the interesting things is... Which is as healthy. To acknowledge the conflict, strike me, would be a better form of debate. Mm-hmm. Another one would be, of interest to me, is the the right, if that's possible, of communities, mm-hmm. and particularly religious communities, to order their own affairs with integrity for their beliefs, whether mm-hmm. they be right or wrong, and the right of individuals to be treated without discrimination. And I think that's an example that's really pertinent in Australia today and certainly is going to be the subject of further debate and discussion, I think, um, in coming years. Because, again, it's an example where I think everybody can recognise um, the rights on either side. Mm-hmm. How you bring them together is well, really hard. But that's not – well, I, I may be in the wrong places, but I don't see that recognised on either side. It seems to me on the religious freedom debate, those particularly of the LGBTQI communities – on the whole, regard the claim to, to religious freedom as a statement made in bad faith. That is, you really want to you say that because you want to discriminate against us. Mm. I've heard that almost said. On the other side, uh, those in religious communities never scratch their heads to think, how can I make sure that, let's say, LGBTQI people have the highest possible social and uh, uh, political freedoms in this society? I don't see, I don't see the context where people are acknowledging. Both the conflict sides. that there actually is a conflict, mm. it becomes. A, but also, a, a, now that strikes me as a major, major problem. But also importantly in that that there is validity to the the rights and the um, the arguments being put forward on both sides. That's that's, that, yeah, that's exactly right. And that right, inherent right. dignity. I, I think the starting point for that discussion, which often gets lost, is every single person should be able to live a life where they have dignity and respect and equality. And if we start from that point, surely. You can find a way mm. to to make it work so that those basic principles are respected. But it's easy to say in theory, much harder to do in practice. Yes, and it's the questions of whether people think others have bad faith, whether... And that's a really important point because one of the things that has worried me about a lot of the, um, not only in the human rights arena, but a lot of the really important policy discussions that we're having at the moment in Australia seem to start from a position of, if you disagree with me, I'll assume bad, bad faith, faith on your yes. part. Yes, and the that. minute you take that road, I think you lose the opportunity to actually reach good, solid solutions. If this isn't a human rights issue, I don't think, but the discussion about the uh, Indigenous voice mm-hmm. um, to Parliament and to the executive, I'm finding it hard to hear either side believing in the good faith of the opponents to their view. There, there yeah. seems to be both regard each other as putting on a con, either a con to support racism or a con to somehow grab power. And the really That's sad, terrible. The really sad part or the tragedy of that language and that type of debate is, again, you lose sight of the common agreement around the fact that we all want all Australians to have the same opportunities. We all want all Australians to have access to the best education, the best health care, the best environments to grow up and thrive. And having practical ways of achieving that is really important yes. and unfortunately gets lost in some of the rhetoric. Now, in your work, um, people can make complaints to you, can't they? I, I, right? They can make complaints to the Human Rights Commission. Commission. The complaints process is actually separated from the specific purpose commissioners, so it's the president that has jurisdiction oh, over all of the complaints. So you're, you're not a complaint judge at Between Us? I'm not. Other than amongst your children, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> Other than amongst my children, in which case so, I lose most of the time. So you are really, your job is to be an educator and an advocate rather than a decider of, of uh, who's right or wrong. Correct. So the, the advocacy role of the commission and the role the commission plays in promoting and protecting gotcha. human rights, inquiring into government actions, um, making recommendations to government is quite separate from the specific complaints function. Right. So I was going to ask you a question about that and I can't <laughs> Because by the time it gets to a complaint, we seem to be a long way away from recognising each other's rights. It's uh, 
Do you know anything about the kind of complaints you get in general terms? Well, I do. And and you mean the commission, not yourself, I mean. Certainly. Well, the commission as a whole receives a significant number of complaints. And of course, over the last few years, that's increased considerably through the pandemic and with the pandemic restrictions. So the complaint function of the commission is one that is really important for a number of reasons. But one is the idea that it's trying to um, undertake a process of conciliation rather than having people go straight to court. So the idea of actually getting right. people to come together and to try and reach agreement on issues um, rather than going through an adversarial legal process is one that I think is really worthy. Do you think Australia is wrong? I think we're one of the very few countries in the world of uh, modern liberal democracy. Not have a much more, uh, some sort of a formal bill of rights, uh, of, mm -hmm. uh, uh, either legislated or even in a constitution, which many countries have. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a good or bad thing that we seem to not have that? Well, you know, this is one of those issues that I do think reasonable people can disagree on. And I have been on the record as saying I have very real doubts and concerns about whether a charter of rights is yes. the best way to protect human rights. And the reason I say that is when you look at our Australian constitution, the founding fathers didn't just forget to put a Bill of Rights in and they didn't decide not to include a Bill of Rights because they didn't think human rights were important. They actually had a lot of discussion and debate about the best way to protect rights. And in their view, the best way to protect rights in line with accepting the fact that you need to make these compromises and you need to um, have a diversity of views and perspectives and choices reflected, the best way to protect rights was through the democratic process of a robust parliament in the Westminster system. And so that was a deliberate choice that was made. And I think it served Australia well. We have one of the most durable and successful constitutions mm -hmm. in modern history and one of the most durable and successful democracies in modern history. And I think that's part of the reason. One of the benefits that I see in the lack in that decision mm -hmm. was our judicial officers are not politicised. Mm -hmm. Not much anyway, there's occasional little, little touches. Because if you leave it to the judiciary to make decisions on policy, which is ha what's happened in the United States. And that's at the heart of human rights questions. Uh, you can get the problem of politicising judiciary and also what the judiciary gives, it can take away, as we saw in the uh, abortion matter in America, mm -hmm. not really through the democratic processes with argument and, and its settlement. And I think the other thing it does is it doesn't give you an outlet when people don't agree with the decision. And that happens when you're talking about human rights and compromises. So again, you see this reflected in America that when the Supreme Court pronounces um, a particular result in yes, relation to yes. the constitution, that's the end of it. There is nowhere to go other than changing the composition of the Supreme Court and relitigating. Whereas in Australia, yes, yes, yes. if we disagree with a piece of legislation or a program or an approach from the government, you can actually lobby your members of parliament. You can stand for election. There are actually different ways that you can engage in democracy to try and change or influence yes. that that approach. I, I was shocked at the reaction in America to the re, to the Supreme Court decision about Roe versus Roe, Roe versus Wade. Mm. Um, not at the decision, I, or, or even about abortion. That's not the issue. But the way in which people took upon themselves to blatantly criticise and, and and again accuse of bad faith. Mm. Even it turned out. Leaders of other, even Prince Harry. I mean, of course, no one knows more about the American Constitution than a, a, a than a member of the British royal family. It was astounding to me that, that where is the rule of law? Where was the love of the rule of law, which is a great danger to democratic society by taking away rule of law? And I do think one of the big human rights issues that we have lost sight of in recent years is the importance of the rule of law, and oh, the yeah. absolute fundamental nature of having those agreed principles about the rule of law. And this case was a great example because, you know, what um, the Supreme Court actually did, and again, whatever your views are on abortion, this isn't a comment about the rights or wrongs of that, no. but what the decision did was return the issue to the state legislatures, which is exactly the position here in Australia. And it was quite an interesting reflection to think about some of the um, foreign leaders who made comments on the Supreme Court judgment. And again, regardless of your views on abortion, the fact that they were critical of that decision when in fact their own countries in some cases had, had laws yes, that were more restrictive was astounding. So I think we've again lost sight of this democratic notion that there will be differences in the way that countries and people approach different issues, and that's actually okay. In fact, aren't I right that some of the countries with the most strict Bill of Rights are the least free countries? That's absolutely right. It, a Bill of Rights, you know, 
certainly I understand why people think a Bill of Rights is very important. And within the Commission, we've got a program at the moment called Free and Equal that's doing some research around how laws in Australia can be reformed and particularly whether a Bill of Rights may play a role yes. in strengthening human rights. I think that's a really worthwhile conversation to have. Mm. But it is true that a Bill of Rights in and of itself is a piece of paper. And so yes. unless you have the... Um, the country and the citizens of a country that are prepared to actually give force to those words, they don't actually have any meaning. So some of the most despotic regimes in the world have some of the best bills of rights on paper. And a great example is North Korea. Yes. They have an extraordinary constitution that includes a wide range of rights, including freedom of religion, freedom of speech, the right to leisure, right to education, right to health care. Right to leisure. The right to leisure. I'm going there. <laughs> and yet, I would say there well, is somewhat of a disconnect no, between no, no. the constitution how, and rights in practice. How, how does that happen? Um, what overrides the, alleged, the, the, rule, the, the right? Is it... I mean, what does the government say when they say freedom of religion, but you can't bring a Bible into this country, which that, is the case, I believe, in North Korea. But this is where unless you have the surrounding, you know, a constitution in and of itself is important, but yes. unless it's underpinned by constitutionalism, which is yes. a belief in actually respecting the limits that the document places on your governance, yes. it's meaningless. And that's where we go back to the, the rule of law question, I think, too. Without some Correct. consensus about the laws, society falls into very serious danger. Well, and not problem. only consensus about the laws, I mean, so but a consensus cons that we'll obey the laws, not, 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 not the content of the laws. And that's that social contract that's idea, right. an agreement that we'll all obey the law, but also that the government will respect the checks and balances yes. in place and the yes. limits that we place on their power. Yes, yes. What what do you think is the most under uh, under recognised human right at the moment? Well, who's who's at the back of the uh, who's at the back of the queue at the moment, uh, Lorraine Quinlay? You know, the really sad thing is, I think there's a very very long list, oh. um, and it depends on a whole variety of things. But interestingly, um, you know, I think it's fair to say the last few years have really brought home to many Australians the importance of human rights in the day to day, and I think for a lot of Australians, not all. But a lot of Australians, up until the pandemic, you were able to get up, go about your life and not really have to think about human rights because your rights were pretty well protected and it just wasn't something that came into your daily lives. The fact that people now have had a real experience of not being allowed to leave their home, not being allowed to go to school, not being allowed to go to work, having real restrictions placed on Five them. Five kilometres from your home. Having playground shut. Um, you know, there are whole curfews. There's a whole variety of things that have happened over the last few years. And again, rightly or wrongly, we can, you know, reasonable people can disagree over the extent of some of those restrictions and why they were in place and their importance, et cetera. But the underlying fact is it's given us a very real experience of why human rights and matter. It seemed to me that when it first came out, we, out of fear mm -hmm. and and respect for the government looking after us, we had no idea of any future, no, no no vaccines. We all complied. I remember feeling, but today uh, uh, we're recording this. There's still COVID out there. Some say yes. even more. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true or not. But no government would dare um, try and impose these again. That means Australians have somehow or other got over this. They were compliant. And people noticed how compliant we were. That was, we thought that was rather un-Australian. Well, now we're less compliant. It's interesting. I think that's right to some degree. But on the other hand, we've become very accepting of certain things that years ago we never would have accepted as being normal. Okay, yeah. And now we have. And an example I'll give you is the idea of living in a state of emergency. Because the idea of a government declaring a state of emergency was unthinkable a few years ago. And yet at the moment, for example, in Western Australia, there still is one. You'd never know it because people are travelling and moving freely. I think that's and, the point, isn't it, really? And, and I think that's it. We, we've almost normalised yes. emergency um, circumstances and that's a real problem. And it gets back to the point we were making before about the importance of democracy and parliaments in terms of protecting rights because one of the real challenges of the emergency situation is you can understand early on you need government to act quickly and decisively to deal with the unknown. But as it goes on, the fact that Parliament was so undermined and that we're, um, we really did have the executive taking yes, over yes. Um, has created some real problems, I think, in terms of yeah. ensuring that there were proper limits placed on restrictions and ensuring that there was proper reflection and balance brought into the various restrictions that we all had to live with.
I'm coming to an end. I'm afraid it's been so enjoyable talking with you, Lorraine. Really. Um, you, you were a lawyer, academic lawyer, if I'm right, before, I before you got a real job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I worked as a prosecutor first of all. Oh, course. really? I, I, so that was are. a real job. <laughs> um, what, what, what's the biggest thing you learned when you, when you got this job? Because there was some question mark about whether you were the right kind of person because of your well-known liberal, not political, but liberal philosophical views. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the one thing that surprised you about the job or what you've learned in coming into it? Yeah, I've learned an enormous amount in the job, but I think what has been really important to me is during my career, I've had jobs which have been very practical, for example, working as a prosecutor, yes. and then I've gone to the other extreme by working as an academic. Yes. And what I love about this job is it really is a mix of the two. So you need to think of human rights from first principles. You need to have that intellectual yes, 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 yes. Um, consideration given to various issues. But at the end of the day, the job is about making a difference in people's lives. And when we think about human rights, we often talk about them in the abstract and in a way that's really disconnected from our day-to-day -day lives. Yes. And what I'm really hoping to do through this job is to remind people that those abstract ideals matter when we bring them down to our day-to-day -day lives. And at the end of the day, human rights is really about how we treat each other and just in our daily interactions, bringing in respect and equality and dignity and compassion and all of those rights-related things that we talk about, it's not something that you leave to government to do. It's not something that you leave to the United Nations to do. It's all the lawyers. All the, oh, heaven forbid, all the lawyers. All the lawyers. It's something that each and every one of us actually needs to practice in our daily lives and we shouldn't be relying on bills of rights or governments or bureaucrats to tell us what our human rights are. We actually should be having those conversations as a society and putting it into practice in our daily lives. All right, Finlay, thank you very much. Lovely talking with you. Thanks so much. This has been another podcast from the Centre for Independent Studies. For decades, the CIS has been an independent voice working to deliver evidence-based policy within a classical liberal framework. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our cause. Head to cis.org.au to see how you can get involved. I'm Rob Forsyth. Thank you for listening.